Good evening and welcome to Bibliology 101, Bibliology and Bible Overview, BI 101, taught to you by the New Covenant College here at the Institute at the New Testament Baptist Church of Dover, Tennessee. We come tonight to Lesson 11, Week 11 in this course, and uh, we are going to transition into a new section of our class. Now, for the last 10 classes, we focused on the history and the transmission of the text, and we've looked at uh, the history of how we got our Bible and the doctrine of providential preservation and all that that entails, and we looked at that under the section of the authorship of the Bible. If you remember way back in the very first week, or if you uh, are looking at your syllabus, you will see that we have three primary sections. The first of that was the authorship of the Bible, and uh, soon we will consider the contents of the Bible, and that's where we will spend the rest of this class, uh, where we look at the overview of what is contained in Holy Scripture. So we're moving away now from uh, bibliology, and we're moving into that Bible overview section. But before we get into the contents of the Bible, we first need to consider the readership of the Bible. That's what we're going to look at tonight, or we're going to look at the readership of the Bible. And uh, when we do this, we must understand that this is a, a very important subject for us to comprehend because if we get something wrong with the readership, we're going to have issues when we start to look at the contents of the Bible. So uh, what we're going to consider tonight is something called hermeneutics. We're going to look at hermeneutics and the principles of interpretation. Hermeneutics. You tell people you're studying hermeneutics and they say, Herman who? <laughs> but um, I had a professor in college whose middle name was Herman and he told people that his name was Robert Hermeneutics, but uh, that was, uh, he might, may very well have been, he's a very wise man and taught me hermeneutics, uh, but now I want to present this to you. It's a very important study. Um, hermeneutics uh, is the art and science of interpreting the biblical text, and time does not permit us to spend multiple classes on this study, so this will be a very basic an introductory look at hermeneutics, um, but we need to consider several principles and several rules that you need to know before you begin looking at the overview of Scripture. As I said, this will be a very brief study. We only have one class to focus on this. Time doesn't permit us to spend any more time than that. But I do want to recommend very quickly two books to you for a more in-depth and detailed treatment of this subject. I would recommend uh, two books. One is An Introduction to Biblical Hermeneutics by W.R. Downing. An Introduction to Biblical Hermeneutics by W.R. Downing. I believe that's in your uh, bibliology for this course attached to your syllabus or somewhere. Uh, there you should have that information. And also Knowing Scripture by R.C. Sproul is a, another very helpful book. He wrote that for someone with no Bible college or seminary training. The average churchgoer uh, now has a resource where they can understand some of these interpretive principles. It's very important that we have a firm grasp on this and it'll save us from a lot of trouble down the road. That's kind of like building a house. If you start out with a good foundation, uh, you will have a better construction as you go along. But if you have an uneven or a shaky foundation and you put that house up, eventually it's going to start to settle. And because that foundation is shaky, you're going to have cracks in your drywall and your, your uh, walls are going to be uneven and your baseboards are going to be crooked, kind of like it looks at my house. So uh, <laughs> you want to avoid that when it comes to studying the Bible. So what is hermeneutics? Well, as I said, hermeneutics is the science of biblical interpretation which seeks to understand the message of Scripture. I'll say that again. Hermeneutics is the science of biblical interpretation which seeks to understand the message of Scripture. You'll hear people ask this question about a particular group or uh, a, a certain sect or denomination of Christianity. You'll, you'll hear them ask, what is their hermeneutic? What is their hermeneutic? How do they get to that 
doctrine or that conclusion? What is their hermeneutic? And when that question is asked, what we're asking is, what rules do they follow when interpreting Scripture that lead them to that conclusion? Right? Um, hermeneutics are very important because they determine how we interpret Scripture and how we understand what the Bible teaches. And I'm going to be giving you a lot of examples tonight of this to kind of help you understand it. But basically, imagine if you interpreted the, the entire Bible with a completely symbolic hermeneutic. Everything in the Bible is symbolic. Nothing is literal. Well, when you read Genesis, you're not going to come away with, hey, this is a historical account of creation because to you it's all symbolic, right? So that, that would be one example. So hermeneutics should be studied then by all Christians, not just elders, not just teachers, not just pastors. Uh, this is not just something that the man in the pulpit needs to know, but this is something that you need to know. I will say this, uh, the Bible in the hands of someone with poor hermeneutics can be a very dangerous thing because you can make the Bible say whatever you want it to say if you try hard enough or uh, if you don't try at all, so to speak, uh, if you have poor hermeneutics, right, you can use the Bible, or should I say misuse the Bible, and make it teach things that it's not truly teaching. So, hermeneutics are a very important study. Uh, I'm going to suggest two hermeneutics tonight that you need to use and apply. I, of course, like I said, we don't have time at looking at all of the faulty or liberal hermeneutics, uh, but I want to suggest two hermeneutics uh, that you should apply when you're reading your Bible. The first is the grammatical historical hermeneutic. The grammatical historical hermeneutic. And you'll see this... Uh, in textbooks, and you'll hear people preach about this and talk about this, and you might see it as the historico-grammatical or the grammatico-historical, uh, but the key words there are grammatical-historical. You want a grammatical-historical hermeneutic. Uh, this is a little different than what some people speak of when they talk about a grammatical-historical-literal hermeneutic, a little different there. Um, but we want to make sure that we've got a grammatical historical hermeneutic. What is that? What, what am I talking about? Well, this hermeneutic strives to understand the original meaning of the text as intended by the prophet or apostle that wrote it. Okay? We are trying to get the original intent of the Bible. We call this the authorial intent. You hear people in, in the political realm debating how should we interpret the Constitution. And you'll hear people talk about the original construction, right? Uh, that is, we need to interpret the Constitution when we're trying to figure out how should we interpret the Second Amendment. We need to know, well, what did the Founding Fathers mean when they wrote it? Okay, well, it's the same with the Bible. What did Paul mean when he wrote Romans? Not what does some 18th century higher critic, or what does some liberal theologian think it means? No, what did Paul mean when he wrote it? Uh, also, this means that there's no hidden meaning to the book, right? There's no underlying meaning. I always laugh at those people that are always looking for some hidden meaning. They're always trying to read between the lines, and they don't even bother to read the lines themselves, right? The book of Romans doesn't have some hidden spiritual super secret meaning. It means exactly what Paul intended for it to mean. Paul knew what he meant when he wrote it, so our job is simply to figure out what Paul meant, right? And it's the same with every book. Uh, so it's, it's grammatical because it follows the basic rules of grammar. It follows the basic rules of grammar. There's no such thing as Holy Spirit Greek. It's just Greek, right? Uh, and there's no such thing as Holy Spirit English. It's just English. In the Bible, a verb is a verb and a noun is a noun. Okay, And it's historical because it is in accordance with the facts of history. Okay, So, grammatical and historical. It's in accordance with the facts of history. So that's the first thing we need to look at. But then, a second one, and this one, uh, most all of your Bible teachers will agree with this right here. Grammatical, historical. Any 
conservative Orthodox Bible teacher will agree with that. But I want to suggest another hermeneutic that I think that we as uh, those who believe in the sovereignty of God over the affairs of men, especially uh, those who see the sovereignty of God in the, in the matters of salvation, and when we understand just the overall message of Scripture, we need to understand that the proper hermeneutic for interpreting the Bible is a covenantal or redemptive historical hermeneutic. And uh, these are not, uh, this is not an either or thing. It's not, well, either I'm going to interpret with a grammatical historical or I'm going to interpret with a covenantal redemptive. No, these are just two different hermeneutics and we need to apply both of them consistently throughout the Bible, right? They're not contradictory to one another. They companion one another. They, they accompany one another. That's the word I'm looking for there. Uh, they must, um, this must accompany the grammatical historical interpretation. The grammatical historical hermeneutic provides us with a general overview of how Scripture should be interpreted. The covenantal redemptive historical hermeneutic provides us with the theme that binds Scripture together. What is the theme that binds Scripture together? What, everything has a theme, does it not? All books have a theme. They have a thesis. What is, the, what is the main message of this book? Well, what is the theme of the Bible? I would posit to you that the central message of the Bible is the story of God redeeming a people for Himself through Jesus Christ. That is the theme of the Bible. And all Scripture must be considered in light of the person and work of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, His life, His death on the cross, His deity, His character, His nature, everything He said and everything He did bears its precipice upon everything that is contained in Scripture. Okay, And... Uh, we, we understand then that this hermeneutic is what binds the Scripture together. It's like the scarlet thread that runs through the Bible that allows us to see how different portions of Scripture connect in light of Jesus Christ and His work of redemption. This hermeneutic is redemptive, but it's also covenantal. It's a covenantal hermeneutic. And it's covenantal uh, because... Christ is revealed as the Redeemer through a series of covenants. Now, through a series of covenants. And we don't have time to get into uh, the covenant theology that the Bible teaches, but you must understand that the Bible presents covenants, right? Such as the Adamic covenant, the Noahic covenant, Abrahamic, Mosaic, Davidic, and the New Covenant, right? The Old Covenant, New Covenant. And these covenants show the construction of Scripture and the unfolding of redemptive history. Uh, there's nothing in the Bible that says part one, part two, part three, right? There's just books of the Bible. And we have to understand how these books are all uh, associated one with another. And the way that we can group redemptive history is through God progressively revealing Jesus Christ through the biblical covenants. Okay, so we must understand Scripture with the horizon of, progress, of the progressive history of salvation. Salvation is a progressive history. Right, So, when studying a particular portion of Scripture, you can ask yourself these questions. What does the grammar of this passage convey about its meaning? How does this passage relate to the facts of history? Both the facts of history that the Bible records and the facts of history that we know happened but aren't necessarily directly alluded to in Scripture. What bearing... Uh, do the biblical covenants have on this passage? Hmm. How should this passage be seen in the broader context of redemptive history? So, these are just some hermeneutical rules, hermeneutical principles that we want to apply in our understanding of Scripture. Now, I want to now give you some general principles of interpretation. Some general principles of interpretation. And the uh, the first one that I'll give to you here, I'll put it down here, is what we call the analogy of faith. The analogy of faith. Okay? The analogy of faith. This is the supreme and overarching principle of biblical interpretation. 
Okay? This rule trumps everything else. And this rule teaches, this principle I should say, teaches that Scripture must ultimately inter be interpreted by Scripture. Scripture must be interpreted by Scripture. Holy Scripture is its own interpreter. What is the greatest commentary on the Bible? Well, it's the Bible. <laughs> and I know that sounds tongue-in-cheek, right? And obviously, I, I will be the first to tell you that I love biblical commentaries. I love reading what other men have to say about the Bible. I own far too many commentaries, if you ask my wife. Uh, but you must understand that even those men, if they're solid and they're following the analogy of faith, even in their commentary, what they're going to be showing you is how Scripture interprets Scripture, right? Uh, the supreme arbiter in determining the meaning of any particular verse or passage is the overall teaching of the entire Bible. Does that make sense? When we're trying to figure out, let's say you're studying a verse and you don't know what this verse teaches. Well, here's one way to start in figuring out what that verse teaches. Iron out what you know for sure the Bible teaches, the overall theology of the Bible. Let's say you're reading a verse about the ordinance of baptism, and you're trying to figure out what in the world does this teach. Well, what do you already know about baptism from the rest of Scripture? Right? You can iron it out because you know that Scripture cannot contradict itself. Scripture cannot contradict itself. Remember our study of the perfection of Scripture that we looked at many classes ago. Remember, we, we noted that uh, Scripture will never contradict itself. So if you come to a passage that on the surface doesn't seem to line up with what you know Scripture teaches and affirms elsewhere, rest assured that the problem lies with your interpretation of that particular passage. Never, never, never does the Bible have any issues or problems or contradictions within itself. So, uh, we must understand that Scripture interprets Scripture. Furthermore, let me ask you this question. How many correct interpretations are there for each portion of Scripture? One. There is one and only one. There may be 10,000 applications, right? You may learn 10,000 different practical lessons, but there is only one correct interpretation. There's no such thing as your interpretation or my interpretation. I always love it when I, uh, I'm talking with someone and I quote a verse and say this is what this teaches and they say, well, that's just your interpretation. And I want to say, thank you, Captain Obvious. Of course it's my interpretation. I just gave it to you. Uh, but really and truly, we're not to be seeking our own interpretation. It's not supposed to be, well, this is what I think it means. No, this is what the Bible teaches. That's what we want to arrive at, right? So, uh, there's only one correct interpretation. So if, if I'm quoting a verse and uh, Larry, you're quoting a verse and we're, we have a disagreement about what this verse is teaching, either we're both wrong or one of us is wrong, one of us is right, but we both can't be right because Scripture only has one interpretation and that is what we call objective truth. And that is, that is what we must firmly be rooted in is, is objective truth. We must reject postmodernism in all of its forms. There is a biblical postmodernism that says, well, the Bible can mean to you whatever you want it to mean. We must reject that. There's only one correct interpretation. So the analogy of faith teaches us that each portion being only corrected in, uh, correctly interpreted in one way cannot contradict another portion. Therefore, the Bible has a complete unity and integrity from beginning to end. And the Bible is the only thing that can infallibly interpret the Bible. Okay? So, we want to have an ana the analogy of faith. Uh, second uh, interpretation here, or, or, or general principle, is that of a literal interpretation. That of a literal interpretation. Now, there's a lot of confusion about this. And uh, everyone claims to interpret the Bible literally. Every Orthodox Christian will say, uh, I interpret the Bible literally, and when you disagree with them, especially when we get into prophecy, they'll always say, well, you don't interpret the Bible literally. Well, uh, this, there's a lot of confusion about what does it mean to interpret the Bible literally? Well, it certainly doesn't mean that we apply a woodenly literal interpretation to every verse, right? I mean, if I said it's raining cats and dogs, 
and you took me literally, you would not come away thinking that it's actually raining, that cats and dogs are actually falling from the sky, right? Uh, how many of you think that Jesus is going to return riding a literal horse, wearing a garment that is dipped in literal blood, with a literal sword stuck down his throat and coming out of his mouth? Well, nobody believes that. What, right? We understand that what that passage is teaching is that he's going to come back triumphantly and victoriously and he's going to have a sword coming out of his mouth, the, the words of judgment that, are, that he's going to be speaking and pronouncing when he comes. Right? Uh, so what does it mean to interpret the Bible literally? It means to interpret Scripture in its plain and natural sense. In its plain and natural sense. When I say something like, it's raining cats and dogs, because of the common sense that God has given you, you know very immediately that I am speaking in figurative and symbolic language, right? And a literal interpretation then, when we apply that to the Scripture, means that we interpret Scripture according to the language that God is using. We interpret parables like parables. We interpret symbols like symbols. We interpret poetry like poetry. We interpret didactic literature and didactic teaching as such, we interpret historical narrative as historical narrative, and so on and so forth, because each portion of Scripture has its own rules of interpretation, right? And we would get in a lot of trouble if we tried to interpret historical narrative the same way we'd interpret poetry, or if we tried to interpret symbolic language the same way we would interpret historical narrative, right? We have to, we have to discern the, the sense in which God is speaking. A third general principle, interpret the implicit by the explicit. Interpret the implicit by the explicit. Now, adherence to this simple principle would clear up a number of theological errors. Okay? The explicit teaching of a text must always determine the implications of a text. Are there implications in the Bible? Yes. Are there verses that imply certain things? Yes. But those implications must be governed by what is explicitly taught. We must never make an implication that is not supported by the explicit teaching of a verse. Uh, this would be the death blow to the Arminian interpretation of John 3.16. What do the Arminians do with John 3.16? Well, they read it and they see that it says that God so loved the world, yes, that whosoever believes, yes, uh, shall not perish but has everlasting life, right? And it's true that explicitly John 3.16 teaches that whosoever, anyone that believes in Jesus Christ, anyone that believes in Jesus Christ will not perish but will have everlasting life. And so what the Arminian does, though, which is the fatal flaw, is that he makes an implication that's not supported by the explicit teaching. His implication is that because anyone that believes shall not perish, that must imply that all men in their natural state prior to the regenerative work of the Holy Spirit must possess the ability to believe. But what does John 3.16 teach about man's natural ability to believe? Nothing. It teaches nothing about man's natural ability to believe. It just simply states the fact explicitly that whosoever believes shall not perish. Right? Uh, if, if, I said, if I said anyone that comes to Dover, Tennessee, can get their hair cut at Barrow's Barbershop, that's a true statement. Anyone that comes to Dover. But you'd say, but there's somebody in Canada that's paralyzed and has no means of coming to Dover, Tennessee. Right, but that doesn't mean my statement is incorrect because my statement didn't say anything about anyone's ability to come to Dover. So we can't make implications that are not supported by the explicit teaching. right? And in order to figure out, well, who is able to come, who has the ability to come, we can very simply just check the context of the gospel according to John and we'll find statements where Jesus says, no man can come except to be given him over the Father. Right? So that is what we're talking about with hermeneutics. We interpret the implicit by the explicit. And the last general principle, interpret the obscure by the clear. Interpret the obscure 
by the clear. Now, we affirm the perspicuity, that is just a big theological term for the clarity of all Scripture. All Scripture was given to be understood. But not all portions are as equally clear on the same subjects. Does that make sense? There are some portions of Scripture that just black and white lay out a particular doctrine. But then there's other portions of Scripture that teach the same doctrine but not as clearly. For example, the passage in Revelation that speaks about angels and candlesticks is probably not the best place to formulate your views on church polity and the eldership of the local assembly. Although I've heard men that have done that. They've said, well, see there, uh, each church is a candlestick and they only have one angel, so that's why we have this particular church polity. Well, it, could that speak to church polity? Well, I suppose that it can. But why would we formulate our doctrine on an obscure symbolic passage when we have the pastoral and church epistles that very directly, very clearly teach on that subject? See, so we want to go with what is clearly taught, and then we come to a symbolic passage or something that's a little more obscure. We can interpret that by what is clearly taught elsewhere, right? Uh, take the instance, the, the, the issue of baptism, for example. There are explicit uh, passages in the Bible that teach that baptism is the immersion of a repentant believer into water. Right? There's explicit passages that teach that. So when we get to some of those passages that speak of household baptisms, and it might not necessarily explicitly mention uh, that, that they all believe, they all professed, or somebody might say, well, what if that household had infants? Well, the reason why we can rule that out is because we wouldn't formulate a doctrine like infant baptism on an obscure passage when we have clear passages that lay the doctrine out positively. Right, so we interpret the obscure by the clear. So those are some general principles. Now I want to give you some practical rules. What's the difference between general principles and practical rules? Um, a, a heading in my notes. That's the difference between them. <laughs> uh, no, these practical rules are a little more specifically geared. Okay, And these are some things that can help you as you read and study your Bible. Here's a suggestion that I will give to you. Uh, if you are, and I know this is a 101 course, so if you perhaps, let's say you might be taking this class and you've never read your Bible cover to cover, or perhaps for the very first time in the last several months, you've just started a, a really in-depth study. I would encourage you to write down these principles and these practical rules that I'm about to give you. Write them down on a little half sheet of paper. Put it in the inside cover of your Bible. And then as you're reading and studying your Bible, refer to these notes often. And these practical rules will help you as you read and study the Bible. Okay, the first rule. First rule, read the Bible like any other book. And I know you, you want to gasp. And you say, what do you mean, read the Bible like any other book? It's the Word of God. It's not any other book. Well, you're right. The Bible is the Word of God. But even in the Word of God, a verb is still a verb. A noun is still a noun. Right? A, a preposition is still a preposition. An adjective is still an adjective. God gave us His Word in an intelligible language, and we should read it intelligibly. What do you do when you're reading a, a novel? Well, you read and you try to figure out, okay, who are the characters? What are they doing? Who's the protagonist? Who's the antagonist? What is the moral teaching of this novel? Okay, well, when you read the story of David and Goliath for the first time, you need to understand, okay, David's the protagonist, and the big ugly giant is the antagonist, right? So read the Bible like you would any other book. Don't jump straight to looking for some kind of hidden meaning, right? Just read it. Just read it for what it is. Secondly, read the Bible existentially. Read the Bible existentially. Now, not with some kind of existentialist philosophy, Right? That's not what I'm telling you to do. But read the Bible as a real and vibrant count of reality. Make the Bible real to you. Put your shoes in the sandals of Abraham when God called out to him on Mount Moriah. Imagine what it would be like to stand on the banks of Jordan after you see this Jesus of Nazareth be baptized and then you hear this voice from heaven. This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Imagine what that would have been like. Place yourself in the church of Corinth or in the church of Philippi and imagine what it would have been like 
to be a Christian in the first century and to receive your very own letter from the Apostle Paul. Imagine what that would have been like. I'm not saying to make yourself the hero of all of the stories. I'm not saying that at all. But I'm saying to don't read the Bible as, it, as if it was some distant and removed ancient story. Yeah, the Bible's not aloof, right? The Bible's not, uh, not removed from your life, but it speaks into your life. So enter into the reality of Scripture as it is given. Third rule, discern the genre. Discern the genre, okay? Um, and as a side note, if you are reading and studying your Bible, if you're reading some kind of Bible plan, whatever it is, just make sure that you're reading through books sequentially. That means if you're going, let's say you're going to read the book of Genesis, start in Genesis 1-1, read to the end of the book, okay? You don't, you don't lucky dip in the morning, do you? You don't wake up in the morning and say, uh, wonder what God has for me today. Uh, Judas went out and hung himself. No, I don't like that one, so let me flip over. Go and do thou likewise. No, you, you don't want to read your Bible that way, right? Uh, you want to read it sequentially. That's the way God wrote it. Okay, so uh, that, was a, that was a freebie. But discern the genre. So as you're reading, you need to know what kind of uh, literature am I reading? Because the Bible contains narrative, poetry, symbolism, metaphors, allegory, prophecy. You need to realize what are you reading because each of these different types had their own in rules of interpretation. And you cannot interpret a historical narrative in the same way that you would interpret poetry, so on and so forth, right? So you need to know uh, if I'm in the book of Psalms and I'm reading poetry or I'm reading uh, something that was meant to be sung by the people of Israel, that's different than reading the book of Second Kings and the history of pre-captivity Israel, right? Okay, fourth practical rule, pay attention to the authorship and dating of the book. Pay attention to the authorship and dating of the book. Some of the biblical books are unknown. We don't know who wrote them and we don't know the exact time, but for, most, for the most part, we know about what period of time they were written for the New Testament epistles. We pretty much have a, almost an exact date on most of them, and we know who the author is on, on just about all of them. Hebrews might be the only one we would debate. Um, and you need to know who the author is, right? Because certain authors use certain words in certain ways. Remember when we studied inspiration, we said God inspired his word organically. That is, he allowed the authors to preserve their own vocabulary, right? So you need to be familiar with the Pauline vocabulary and how that might be different from John's vocabulary. And you need to understand that there's certain words that Paul uses that only Paul uses. And there's certain words that only Peter uses, right? And so you need to be familiar with the way that they talk, just like we all talk differently. We don't realize it about ourselves, but there's words that we use often and frequently that are kind of unique to our vocabulary, right? Uh, and also, you need to understand the dating of the book because the historical context matters. For instance, if you're reading the Old Testament prophets, you know, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, and then all the minor prophets, if you're reading a, a prophet... You need to know, well, did they prophesy before, during, or after the Babylonian and Assyrian captivities? That matters, right? Uh, I mean, especially when you look at like Jeremiah, he's prophesying about the captivity. Well, if you don't know that he's writing before the captivity, you won't know what he's prophesying about. Right? So you need to know the dating of those books. Fifth rule. Use the didactic teachings of Scripture to interpret the historical narratives. Use the didactic teachings of Scripture to interpret the historical narratives. Okay? If, uh, let me give you an example. If all you had was the historical account of Calvary and the resurrection as it was given in the Gospels, you wouldn't understand all that took place. Right? The Gospels just to describe it. And about this time, he was hung on the cross. About this time, he said this. About this time, this happened. And then he gave up the ghost and he died, right? And that's all the Gospels say. Ah, but then you get to the didactic portions. And you read Paul, where Paul says, Hey, do you know what was happening on that cross? On the cross, he was delivered for our offenses. And then he was raised again for our justification. He was accomplishing the redemption of God's elect on the cross. Paul's interpreting those historical narratives. And again, that's why we have this covenantal redemptive hermeneutic, right? Um, 
if all you have is in Genesis, the story of Abraham, you might wonder, huh, I wonder what these events in Abraham's life meant. I wonder what the significance of these events were. But then you read in the New Testament where it says, Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. That's what was going on in the Old Testament when Abraham believed the promises of God. Right? So we use the didactic teachings of Scripture to interpret the historical narratives. And here's another freebie. That's why it's good to have a good concordance or a good reference Bible because as you're reading right, those historical narratives, let's say you're reading through the book of Exodus and you get to that part where they're going through the Red Sea and then you see a little side note that points you to Romans 10 and you find out that hey, that it was our spiritual family passing through the water all as one body, and that symbolizes how we as the New Testament church are all identified to the one God and Savior, Jesus Christ, because they all drank from that same rock, and that rock was Christ. You see, we wouldn't know that if all we had was the historical narrative. But we use the didactic portions to interpret the historical narrative. Okay, six, use the plain or literal passages to explain the symbolic, right? Not the other way around. Use the plain or literal to explain the symbolic. Um, I pray that no one here tonight or watching this class believes that Jesus Christ is a literal door. Even though he said, I am the door. <laughs> I hope no one believes he is a literal wooden door bought down at the Home Depot, right? Right? Why? Because we understand that's a symbol. So now we have to say, well, what does that symbol symbolize? <laughs> and we understand that what that literally means, what that symbol literally means is that, well, he is the only way man, or, man enters into a saving relationship with God, right? Uh, Jesus did not come to save literal sheep. He came to save human beings. But the Bible refers to those human beings that he came to save as his sheep. Jesus Christ is not a literal shepherd. If anything, he was a literal carpenter. But that's, these are all symbols, you, you see. And we use the plain passages to interpret the symbols that we find in the Bible. Seven, observe literary devices. Observe literary devices. You know, the Bible is an excellent book to to teach someone to read. The Bible is an excellent book. It contains so many different genres and a variety of authors, and it contains all kinds of literary devices. The Bible uses things such as parallelism, repetition, similes, metaphors, personification, and on and on I could go. Right? And you need to observe these literary devices. As you're reading along, you need to come along, and then when you're reading, you get in the Gospel of Matthew, which is full of the parables of Christ, and you get there to chapter 13, you need to say, oh, that's a parable. And when, when you see that's a parable, in your mind, your interpretive rules should change gears because there's different rules for interpreting parables than there is narrative, right? Um, and you need to really be especially careful with parables and metaphors and allegories and things like that. And understand this, that a metaphor and an allegory and a parable are not the same. They're different literary devices. And if you try to interpret a parable like an allegory, you're going to get in a lot of trouble. What's the difference between a parable and an allegory? Well, allegories are stories in which all the parts more or less correspond with one general truth, but parables are stories with uh, one driving lesson. They're not meant as one a uh, gentleman put it, a parable is not meant to stand on all four legs. All right? you, try to make, you try to make every aspect of a parable correspond with something and you'll, you'll wind up getting confused. The purpose of a parable is to teach one general truth. Right? Um, parables are stories with one driving lesson not meant to stand on all four legs. There's a metaphor for you, by the way. Right? All four legs. Okay? So, uh, you need to observe literary devices. Eight. You need to consider the meaning of specific words as they are used. Consider the meaning of specific words. We must never assume the meaning of a word. Let's never assume the meaning of a word. Um, we must also never allow our theological bias to force a particular definition on a word. Right? Let the words of the Bible define themselves via their context and usage. 
Turn in your Bibles to 2 Peter 3.9. I'm going to give you another classic example in which if just following this simple rule would save us so much heartache. 2 Peter 3.9. Oh boy, do the Arminians love to quote this verse, right? God is not willing, verse 9. The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. There it is right there. God does not want any sinner on the face of the earth to perish. He's not willing that they should perish, uh, but He wants all men to come to repentance. Well, uh, there's some words here that we need to define. First of all, what does the word willing mean? Now, you might say, well, that's obvious. That's obvious, preacher. Willing simply means God does not will for it to be. God does not want it to be. Right? Well, you have to understand, in the Bible, there's various different types of wills when we talk about the will of God. Is this talking about God's prescriptive will? See, it's God's will uh, that you don't lie and steal. But does that mean no one ever lies and steals? No, because it's God's prescriptive or permissive will. It's God's ideal will for man, uh, but it's, it's a will that God desires of us, but we violate. Is that the will that, that is being referred to? Or is it the sovereign, decreative will of God? That will of God that was purposed in eternity and will surely come to pass. What will is he talking about? Well, think contextually we understand he's not slack concerning his promise. That's a singular promise. This will is referring to God's unchangeable, unalterable decree. So now you have to say, well, is God not willing? Is His decree that no one ever die and perish and go to hell? Well, if that were the case, there'd be no lost people. So we know that, see, here's, we're coming to a contradiction. So what's the next word we need to define? Well, we need to define what does this word any refer to? This, what is this, this pronoun, any. Who is the any in this verse? We need to define that. We can't just assume that any means all men without exception. Well, we look right up. How do you, how do you, find, how do you find the meaning of a pronoun? You look for the nearest antecedent, right? Well, what's the nearest antecedent? Right there in verse 9, the us word. The us word. Who are the us word? Those that God has made his promise to. So we see that far from being a verse that teaches Arminianism or far from being a verse that teaches a, a, a free will universal atonement, this is actually a strong sovereign grace verse because it says that God is not slack concerning His promise to usward, those He has promised to redeem. He's not willing, He has not decreed that any of His elect should perish, but that all of them should come to repentance. How did we get to that conclusion? By simply understanding and defining the words of the Bible, right? Not assuming the definition of the word. And the last practical rule, be responsible with prophecy. Be responsible with prophecy. What is the one book of the Bible that has been more sensationalized and dramatized than any other book? Revelation, right? There's movies and book series. I tell you, the only thing that was left behind in the Left Behind series was the Bible. <laughs> uh, and if there's, you know, if there's any book that needs to be strictly interpreted according to these fundamental principles and sound hermeneutics, it is the book of Revelation because, let's face it, it is a more difficult book to interpret. It's a harder book to understand. And so we need to, especially with Revelation, see, what most people do is they interpret the Bible in a pretty solid, orthodox way, and then they get to Revelation, and they just, just, you know, throw caution to the wind and do whatever you want to. But no, we need to stick with these same rules. We need to discern the genre. Obviously, it's prophecy, right? It's not historical narrative. It's prophecy. It's, it's symbolic, and we need to interpret it as such. You know, I think it's so funny that the people that boast about holding to such a literal interpretation of Scripture are also the ones that talk about uh, Apache attack helicopters and, and uh, all of these different things, right? You have to understand that's no more literal than anything else because it's a symbol.
So if you really want to have a literal interpretation, you don't need to be looking for attack helicopters. You need to be looking for giant locusts. And uh, I don't know any commentators, hardly, that think we're going to have actual giant locusts. We all agree that it's a symbol of something, so we, we ought not get into these debates of I interpret it literally and you don't. We just need to understand, yes, it's a symbol, but we need to figure out what does it symbolize and how do we do that? How do we, we just saw that rule. We let the didactic or the literal or the plain interpret the symbols. So don't read Revelation as some distant, unconnected book, but read Revelation as one of the books of the Bible. Therefore, the supreme interpretation of Revelation is going to be found in the Bible. So be responsible with prophecy. In the high school that I teach at, uh, we, we read through the entire New Testament as the student, uh, the student body read through the entire New Testament. And I sat in with them uh, t today as we finished up Revelation and we were reading there at chapter 13 on, the, on the, the mark of the beast and the number of the beast. And I said, I said, I'm not going to tell you what I believe the 666 is. But let me just tell you this. It is not the latest news story on CNN. <laughs> it is not just whatever you may have seen very recently. Every uh, few months, somebody is convinced that this new spectacle is the mark of the beast, right? So we just need to be responsible with prophecy. That's all that I ask of you. Find you a solid historical commentary on the book of Revelation. Find you some commentaries on prophecy that represent different views. Read for yourself. Be prayerful and be considerate. But let me tell you this, and this is the case with just about any other doctrine. If you are holding to an interpretation of revelation or prophecy or anything really that has no historical attestation, you are the first guy to ever come up with this interpretation. You better be cautious about that. You better be cautious about that. There's safety in the wisdom of God's people. So uh, these are just some uh, practical rules, general principles to help with our hermeneutics. Something that you should consider, something you should write down, jot it down, keep it in your Bible. Uh, next time we meet together, we're going to begin an overview of the Bible. We're going to begin at the beginning with Genesis, right? And so as we're giving an overview of the Bible over these next nine classes, you need to keep these rules of interpretation in mind. Obviously, we're not going to be able to teach through the whole Bible, but as we give an overview, you need to keep these rules of interpretation in mind, and you will see how Scripture connects together in the beautiful testimony that God has given us in His Word. All right, hope this was a blessing to you. Thank you very much, and we will see you next time.